Good morning. The first thing I'd like to do is say uh, congratulations uh, to a couple that just got married, uh, Larry and Tina uh, Lawrence. And I spent the last couple days in Grafton, West Virginia. And they were married at the Mother's Day Shrine, which is a church there downtown Grafton. Uh, but I was pretty popular in that town. I don't know why. <laughs> the, uh, you know, there's all, it's, it's always good to have a story with a wedding, but we had some big storms yesterday. They made it to the reception and all the power went out. And, uh, and fortunately they had hired like a, uh, a barbecue that was like cooked outside and they didn't need any electricity for it. So everybody just moved the whole reception outside after the rain. The power never went back on, but everybody had a wonderful time. And uh, so congratulations to them. Another announcement, there's a picnic sign-up sheet. And uh, so August 15th is gonna be a big day. In church, we'd like to invite anybody who wants to become a new member or a or transfer their membership or have a reaffirmation of faith if you'd like to become part of this church officially uh let us know let either dave or me know uh beforehand and uh, it's a very simple but nice service uh, so we're going to be doing that august 15th and then after church we're going to have a church picnic. So there is a church sign-up sheet for the picnic over on the coffee table. And uh, the church is gonna provide hot dogs and buns and water. Uh, so we're asking that different people volunteer to bring other things uh, to the picnic. Um, doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, it's going to be at Spears, uh, park pavilion number one all right and the first pavilion they they it's three they reversed them okay the first pavilion that you get to all right and uh, i also wanted to thank uh deacons um we had the uh carpets cleaned in the lounge and the entire uh basement facilities and uh, they look wonderful. Um, we only have two weeks left for our Bible study, but it's, it's been a wonderful experience and uh, we hope it will continue as well. Uh, because uh, I just really enjoyed this Bible study with everybody, I'm just wondering, uh, because we have to plan so far ahead, uh, if uh, anybody would have any ideas about something to do during Lent. I know I asked about the history of this church and what you might have done in the past, and I don't think we can have weekly Lenten dinners. That would be quite a bit of work for everybody, but I do think we could do something every week during Lent. I'm just looking for some creative ideas. It could be anything from another Bible study to... Uh, maybe a, a conversation about a topic and coffee or whatever whatever you might think we have a long it's a long way off but it's good to plan about these things the final thing is uh you should have received the newsletter and in the newsletter is a calendar of events and we have a lot of nice things coming up uh, for the fall uh, and it should be a calendar that you can simply rip out and put on your refrigerator with a magnet. And uh, we're also thinking about how we want to advertise in a mass mailing for the entire community. And we're going to try to do that uh, before the fall. That's the announcements. Uh, join me in our call to worship as it's printed in the bulletin. We celebrate the loving presence of God in our life. May God's loving presence be a strong influence in our life. 
Nurturing God, we gather in your name to worship you. We rejoice that God teaches us about love and forgiveness. As we grow in faith, trust, and love for God, may our worship, witness, and service bring honor to God's holy name. And now please join us in our hymn, When Morning Gilds the Skies, it's printed in your bulletin. Jesus invites us to be honest with ourselves and with one another. Let us pause now to examine our hearts and to confess our sins to God. Merciful God, we come to you for a moment of quiet in our self-made busyness. We come to you for energy in our weariness. We come to you for challenge when we are willing to settle for our own small plans and dreams. We long for the peace of your presence, even as we are afraid of the urgency of your call. Enter, Spirit of God, into each of our lives and enliven us. Enter, Spirit of God, into our community and enable us to love and serve you and all your children. Amen. A moment of silent confession. Jesus invites the thirsty to drink from his well. Jesus invites the hungry to dine at his table. In Christ, we are forgiven. We are filled. We are made whole. Let us hear, accept, and embody this good news. Thanks be to God. Join me now in the Nicene Creed. We believe in the one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, 
was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Join me in our responsive reading from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that you may, that your way may be known upon the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. Thank you. 
wonderful. Uh, so I believe Zoe had the basket. I'm not too worried. I'll worry when Noah gets the basket. <laughs> All right. Whoa. All right. Is this the one we made the other day? Yeah. Wow. So they took old books that were no longer any good. They were damaged or something uh, from the library, and they made hedgehogs out of them. Yeah. So. I don't think there are any hedgehogs in the Bible, unfortunately. Huh? You bet there are. Yeah, well, probably back in Genesis when they made them. But, you know, uh, the hedgehog really is a miracle of nature. You know, they are one of the most popular pets now. And uh, even though you might think that is a rare thing, but uh, they can fit in your hand, and uh, they're very docile. Yeah, you, you, well, yeah, you got a little hand. But you think uh, those spikes uh, would be an issue, but they're very smooth, and you can pet them. It's only when they have fear or feel threatened that they curl into a ball and all the spikes point out and they are completely protected from any predator that might be chasing them. And uh, so, you know, God gives each and every one of us and every animal in nature its own unique gifts. Some are good at foraging for a certain type of food or making a safe home. Some have built-in protection, like hedgehogs or porcupines. And uh, the other interesting thing about hedgehogs is that they're nocturnal, which means they're up all night, just like Elliot. And uh, they run 20, well, two to, two, I, think, I, I remember correctly, about they run two miles every night searching for food and uh, gathering uh, berries and everything else. And because they're so small, two miles is quite a bit of distance. But if you can picture one in your apartment or your house running two miles all night long every night, it's going to take a very special person to have one as a pet. So I think, you know, when we look at hedgehogs, you know, we see a cute, cuddly, little, spiky creature. But it really does have unique gifts from God. Like Sonic. Like Sonic, the hedgehog. See, I didn't realize that they invented Sonic to be running all around through that game because hedgehogs actually run. Uh, yeah, I read that a little while ago. So, but here's the question. Kids, what kind of special gifts did God give you? Sonic has these special spikes and speed, and he's not curl. But what gifts do you think? Well, yeah, the normal hedgehog, we can't talk. Do you know any special gifts you have? No, think about it. Any gifts? Any gifts? How about over here? You kids have any special gifts? Anything you're really good at? What are you good at? What do you like to do? Like maybe a hobby? I'm sorry. That's a good one. Good example. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, let's say a prayer. Lord God, we just thank you for all of our unique gifts. Even if we don't recognize them yet, help them to unfold before us so that we can use these gifts in your name. Amen. So if you don't know what your unique gift is, you'll figure it out. All right. Uh, we're going to pass this out again. We're only going to do this 
a Labor Day, so you don't have a lot of chances. But I think every child will get a term by Labor Day. You can have it again, or I can give it more money than you get. All right. There you go. Let's read our scripture passage. Uh, we only have one scripture passage because it's a little longer. It comes from Acts 4, 1 through 12. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who had heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Anas, the high priest, was there, and so were uh, Cephas, John, Alexander, and other members of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel... It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for, this is, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So, many of our sermons have, might have a scripture passage about a miracle. So I've touched on miracles many times over the last couple years, but I wanted to take a little closer look at miracles themselves, miracles in general. And I thought this was the perfect passage to do that. You know, I've seen many things that might be explained away by science, but in my own heart, I believe they were a miracle. I remember one time in my very first church uh, about 30 years ago in Perry County, um, I... Uh, they did not have a lot of uh, services, uh, and one of the prerequisites for a minister to take that church is the minister also had to learn how to be an ambulance driver. So everybody had dual roles in that town. Um, so uh, I had taken one of the parishioners uh, to the hospital, and then I drove her daughter to the hospital, and we were in the emergency room, and she was having, so she was older and having some severe heart problems, and they had the heart monitor hooked up, and things were not looking good, and uh, so uh, we all held hands, and and we held. Uh, the woman's hand and we said a prayer and as soon as we said amen uh, we watched the heart monitor bounce back to normal and uh, we thought that yes our prayers had been answered um, there are other things uh, throughout my life um, a thing that many people might pray about meeting the right person to marry and have a family with. Um, 
and uh, so many other things. I'll share one other personal story with me, with you. Um, and uh, when Trisha and I were having our second child, Noah, um, my mother, who was elderly at the time, uh, called me from Chambersburg. I was in Pittsburgh, and uh, I could tell that she wasn't making sense on the phone. And so, you know, I, I, they call it a mental status exam, and I guessed that she was having a stroke. So I drove, pick her up, picked her up, and drove to Hershey, and in fact, she was having an aneurysm, and we weren't sure whether she would make it through the night. She was in that place in between life and death. Um, she was aware of some things and not aware of other things. Um, she was talking to relatives who were deceased. Uh, but once she was stabilized, I got a call uh, from Tricia my neighbor was taking her to the hospital to have a baby. So I rushed from Hershey to a Pittsburgh hospital, St. Clair, and, uh, and she had Noah, and I was sleeping in the room that night, and there was a pretty serious complication, and uh, internal bleeding and a lot of things, and everybody was worried about her health as well, and we were all praying. Well, she made it through okay, baby made it through okay. We felt very blessed. Uh, two days later, uh, my mother's condition stabilized, and I went to visit my mother. And of course, nobody wanted to worry her about what was going on. We were just going to tell her the good news. We have a new baby, or a grandmother. Uh, but when I walked into her room, she started talking about how sorry she was for uh, all of the things that were going on with Trisha's complication. And she told me that she was praying all night for her, but nobody had told her that this would happen. And uh, so a lot of uh, interesting things happen in our lives. And this is not even to mention all of the miracles that surround us every day. I believe that there are so many different kinds of miracles, miracles that we don't ask for, that God just blesses us with. Uh, the way God talks to us through scripture, through nature, through other people, just when we need the right thing to be said to us. I believe that God does intervene with prayer, but as I've said before, God might not answer yes immediately. Sometimes God answers no, and that was the perfect response. Sometimes God says yes, but not quite yet. We're gonna do it in a totally different, unexpected way. And sometimes God answers yes to prayer immediately. How wonderful it is to answer when we're asked about something we did. How often do we say, I did this in the name of Jesus Christ? When Peter was asked this, he's, he was asked, by what power or name did you do this? And he replied, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Who, G, who God raised again from the dead. When people ask us, why did you do that? Or by whose authority did you do that? How often can we answer saying, well, I did this in the name of Jesus. Another question that falls directly on the heels of this last one, how often do we actually notice the miracles that are happening in our lives? How often are our eyes opened to God's work in our lives? I think that there's a direct correlation to these two questions and answers. 
How often do we see miracles? How often can we answer, I did this in the name of Christ? I think they're directly related. Wouldn't it be great if doing God's work was as easy as going to the supermarket, buying some miracle whip and putting it on some Wonder Bread? Our scripture passage today came from the book of Acts, and let's look at what led up to this wonderful answer. Acts is a shortened form of a longer title, the Acts of the Apostles, the Actions of of the apostles and when we're talking about actions we're usually talking about them sharing the word of god the gospel performing miracles or how they dealt with persecution through prayer so the book is actually an account of the apostles actions done in christ's name and this book is actually the second volume of a set of books. We talked about this a little in our Bible study, but the Gospel of Luke was part one, and it was so good, he wrote part two, the Acts. Our passage opens with Peter and John speaking to a large group of people. They were interrupted by the Jewish authorities and thrown into jail and brought for judgment the next day. Why were the authorities so upset? Well, the reason for this is found just a bit earlier in chapter 3. The reason was a miracle. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. So they were going to pray at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him down at the gates of the temple to ask for alms, for donations. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms as well. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive some alms. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were healed and made strong. And jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. So this is what happened. And then, after the miracle, they began to spread the good news, preaching in the temple. As Peter talked, the people listened to his words, to the word of God. And it was not only the miracle that bothered the authorities, but what followed. It was the preaching, the preaching of the gospel, the sharing of the good news about Jesus Christ. The people were beginning to listen to believe, and they now numbered about 5,000. And remember, any miracle doesn't end with that miracle. Any miracle points to the source of that power, of that miracle. It points to the Creator. So they did this miracle, but they spoke about where the, from where the miracle came. Jesus Christ. So we read that Peter's captors consisted of priests, the captains of the temple, the Sadducees. The priests served the temple on a rotating basis, about a week or so. The specific priests happened to be on duty at this particular time. The captain of the temple guard was a member of one of the leading priestly families, the high priest. The next in rank to the head priest. The Sadducees were a Jewish sect whose members came from the priestly line and controlled the temple. They didn't believe in the resurrection or a personal Messiah, but they believed that the Messianic age was upon them, and this needed to be preserved. Yet, this was not a question of the resurrection, but a question of healing authority. The next day, Peter was asked by Anas, 
What power or what name did you do this in? How did you perform this miracle? When it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he answered them saying, rulers of the people and elders, if, you are, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to somebody who was sick and are asked how this man was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that this man standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ was healed. You crucified this man and God raised him from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected, and this is from the Old Testament prophecies, and yet it became the cornerstone of a new church. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. What an answer. The council could really say nothing, and they released them. The boldness and the speech of Peter was noted by the council. So think of it this way. Yes, that miracle was spectacular. This man had been begging at the city gates his entire life. And yet, the true miracle was bringing 5,000 people to Christian faith. That's the real miracle, bringing people to faith. So the purpose of the miracle, first purpose, wonderful. They healed a man who couldn't walk. But the real purpose was they brought 5,000 people to believe and to find Jesus Christ. We too are but common people, yet Christ is our Savior. We're his disciples. How often do we answer by saying, I did that in the name of Jesus? Or simply, I allowed Jesus and the Holy Spirit to work through me. But then, how many miracles do we have to answer for? Miracles don't need notoriety. They may be as simple as saying an encouraging word to somebody who's having a bad day. Something so easy might change that person's day into a wonderful day. A miracle might come about as a result of visiting the sick or the lonely, fixing a meal for someone, donating clothes to a shelter. The possibility for miracles are all around us. We only need to open our eyes. There's no shortage of possibilities. We must first use our faith so that God might work through us. We must attempt a miracle. So the first part of any miracle isn't just hoping that it will happen. We actually have to attempt the miracle and have faith that it will happen. Most people do not use their faith in that exact way. We have to take the initiative. We have to do something before we can answer, I did this in the name of Jesus Christ. The word miracle comes from the Latin word mirari, which means to wonder at. It comes from the word miras or wonderful. Wonders can be seen all around us. In the Greek, two words are used for miracle. Ergon, meaning work. Dynamis, meaning power. Or to work a miracle, to perform a miracle. But we know that work is often involved. One time, I was on a mission trip and people had been working there for a while before I came and when I got there they were just about finished with a new pump for fresh water in a village and as the water came out of this pump everybody cried and cheered and clapped and I heard the word miracle over and over and over and in a, many ways this was 
They had no water, they had to walk miles, and even that water was not clean. So they had water in the midst of their village, whereas before they had none. But all of the workers there, all of the missionaries, it took a lot for them to get that pump. They had to collect uh, donations uh, in their home church and community. They had to preach about what a good cause this is, how it would change the lives of many. They had to purchase all of the parts. They had to go through training. How do I put this pump together? They had to find a way to get to the village and to transport all of the parts to the village. And then they had to dig and they had to assemble the pump and pray that they had found water. Sometimes you can dig and there is no water. And it all came together and the village recognized the miracle. I don't wanna say they thought it was a miracle because it was. They recognized the miracle. And all of the people who helped to make that miracle happen did not take personal credit for it. They gave the credit to God. So I'm thankful to all of you who have nurtured me in so many ways since I've been here and one another. All of us here today have been called in some way to a ministry, not just the minister. We were called to minister to one another and to the community, whether it be as a minister or a lay person or a deacon or a member of session or a Sunday school teacher or singing in the choir or whatever it might be. We're all called to witness to God's word and to spread God's gift of love. In a world that might seem antiseptic and jaded, I challenge all of us to seek out what is vital what is miraculous, and to see the needs. Where might we need a miracle? We all experience wonders in our search for miracles. Don't ask to see one happen. Go out into the world, not as a spectator of miracles, but as someone who is open to the possibility of having miracles worked through you. Peter means the rock, and we can follow his example. Let us build upon that foundation of the empty tomb, the cornerstone. Let us use Christ as our cornerstone. Let us each become a rock in the building of this new kingdom and temple. Look around, there are miracles waiting to happen. Make them happen in the name of Jesus Christ. Someone once said, pray as though everything depended upon God. Work as though everything depended upon you. In order for a miracle to occur, the Holy Spirit must work through us. Amen. Join me in our hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
Now is our time to share our joys and our concerns, to give thanks, and to ask for God's intervention in our lives, God's healing power. And then we'll pray. Uh, does anybody have any blessings they'd like to share? Any uh, concerns that you would like us to pray for? Blessings or concerns. Those suffering through the floods in Germany. Yeah, I was watching videos on the news. The uh, floods in Germany, I believe uh, 150 fatalities, and they're searching for many people, and the floods are continuing. So, definitely prayers. Other prayers. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we just give you thanks for all of your blessings. Open our eyes to the miracles around us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might do your will so that wonders might occur, so that we might say, this was done in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to minister to others in need, near and far. Open our eyes to those who are in need of our compassion and our empathy, of our Christian love. Give us the strength and courage so that we might share your word with them, so that they might find comfort and peace, through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for uh, your intervention in our lives, for all those who need healing and protection, who need rescue. Lord, we pray for those who are uh, ill or harmed in any way. Uh, we pray for those who are in the midst of struggle, whatever that struggle might be. We ask for your healing and saving power. Lord, we pray for those who are experiencing emotional issues, whether they be depression, anxiety, or other issues. We pray for those who are experiencing addiction or struggling in other ways. We pray for those who are experiencing grief and loss. We ask that they experience the peace that can only be found through Jesus Christ. Lord, help to bring us together as a community, Help us to minister to those who are searching for a home, a home in your kingdom. Help us to minister in your name, and we pray the way you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Join us in our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
as you go out into the world. Open your eyes to all of the miracles around you. Open your hearts to all of the possibilities that you might allow the Holy Spirit to work miracles through you. And now may the Lord God bless you. May God's face shine upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.